So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you, and purify yourselves, and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress, and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had, and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. As they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them, so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him, and there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he had fled from his brother. And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried under an oak below Bethel. So he called its name Alon Bakuth. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padin Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. And the land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your offspring after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. So Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. There are times in our life when we need to stop and reconsider our relationship with the Lord. And we find that we need to reconnect, rededicate, return to the Lord. Without the daily interaction with the Lord, we have a tendency to do things the way we want to do them, and the way we feel would be best for our situation. However, our ways are not always the ways of the Lord. In our scripture this morning, the Lord has spoken to Jacob. He has instructed him to go back to Bethel, the place where he fled from the base of his brother Esau. Jacob commanded his household to build an altar, put away foreign gods, purify themselves, and change their garments. And then he said, let's rise and go up to Bethel. We have been commanded to come out from among the world and to be a separate and a different kind of people. We are called to be the people of God. Ornithologists now know that the great albatross bird flies around the world several times in the course of its lifetime. Now, these birds can stand all the buffeting winds of the ocean, the ocean gales for days, but they become seasick if they land on the deck of a moving ship. The true Christian can also go across the face of life, buffeted by all the winds and the time and space, as long as he remembers that he is in the world and not of it. If he comes down and becomes part of the movement of this world, he loses his Christian joy and power because he, entire, he is entirely out of his element for which God created him. His pastor Dick's title was, Let's Go Back. Well, in order to return to Bethel, or the old pathways where we know God desires for us to be, we need to initiate some steps with God as the focus. We must return to the altar. We must return to the altar of prayer. You know, God was telling Jacob to go back. Go back and do the same things that you started out doing. Go back to the basics, like our ABCs. Go back and do what works. He said, you know, pray. Pray until you pray through it. And then you hunger and thirst after God. We must return to the altar. 
We must return to the altar of praise. You know, the more we praise Him, the more He will bless us. We need to glorify and magnify God. And God can't get any bigger than He already is because He's sovereign. But we can make Him bigger in us. And by praising Him and showing our appreciation for all that He has done, He automatically becomes a bigger part of our lives. We must return to the altar. We must return to the altar of power. We need to get hungry for the Holy Spirit again. We gain power through praying and praising God in the altars. We have the power available to us. We just need to use it. There was a story once told by Herbert Jackson in a seminary class. He was a new, a new missionary. And he was assigned a car that wouldn't start without a push. So after pondering his problem, he devised a plan where he went to the school that was near his home. And he got permission to have a few of the kids leave class so they could come out and push start his car. And as he made his rounds, he would either park it up on a hill so he could push it and start it running down, or he just left it running. He used this procedure for two years and worked great. Finally, ill health caused his family to need to leave their missionary position. And when the new missionary came to that station, he proudly began to explain to the new missionary how to get the car started and how everything worked. But the new man popped up in the hood and started looking around. Before he could even complete his explanation, the young man says, Why, Dr. Jackson? I believe the only trouble is a loose cable. He gave the cable a little twist, stepped into the car, pushed the switch. And to Jackson's astonishment, the engine roared to life. For two years, he put up with that needless trouble, that needless routine. The power was there all the time. Only a loose, loose connection kept him from putting the power to work. J.B. Phillips paraphrases Ephesians 1, 19 and 20 by saying, How tremendous is the power available to us who believe in God. We just have to make firm that connection with God. His life and His power will flow through us just like that connection on the car. It's there. We just have to make the connection. Secondly, we need to put away some of the distractions of the world. We need to put away our worldly allurements and anything that takes our eyes off of God. To not allow anything to come between us and God. 1 John 2, 15 and 17 tell us, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And the world passes away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. We need to put away those distractions. We need to be, put away the sin that, that often befalls us. You know, Jacob knew how to please God, but he first had to put away his idols. He told his family to purify themselves and put away sin. And he told them to change their garments, which this act was designed to show that they had a repentant heart. Therefore, having these promises below, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 1 Corinthians 7. We need to put away the distractions. We need to put away all that weighs us down and drags us down. We need to do what Apostle Paul said and renew our mind and think on good things. And the weights are not sin, but let them pretend that they can turn into sin. Some people deny the reality of sin, but to do so is to deceive themselves and to make a liar of God. Others laugh at sin, but the Bible says that any fool that makes a mockery of sin is fools. Still others take pride in their sin. But the 
most dangerous attitude of all is to tone down sin and its awfulness. Psychology calls sin a maladjustment. Biology labels it a disease. Ethics suggests that it is a moral lapse. Philosophy regards it as a stumbling in the upward progress of the human race. We need to put away these distractions. Third, we need to listen for the voice of God. Listening sometimes means waiting. We must wait upon the Lord. His, roadmap, his word is our roadmap to righteousness. But it's also a warning sign for our life. We need to read the Bible and work on an intimate relationship with Jesus through the Word. James 1, 21 and 22 tell us, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. We need to listen to the voice of God. We need to listen for His encouragement. With all the problems we have going on in the world today, we need His encouragement more than ever before. Sometimes we receive it through the Word. Sometimes we receive it through interpretations or prophecy. And sometimes we receive it from someone else's testimony to us. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 says, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Sometimes the best way to hear something is through someone else's testimony, something that they have already gone through or experienced. But we need to listen for God's voice. We'll hear it when we're listening, when we're still. We need to listen for His direction. We need to know where God wants us to take our life. Many times through the preaching of God's word, God will speak to our lives. Sometimes it's through those testimonies that we hear from others. But we need to listen to God. Sometimes I think he, uh, God probably feels kind of like former President Roosevelt once felt. There's a story that President Franklin D. Roosevelt got tired smiling, that big smile of his, and saying all the usual things in those White House receptions. So one evening he decided to find out if anybody actually paid attention to what he said and listened to him. So as each person came through the reception line, he extended his hand, flashed a big smile, and cried out, I murdered my grandmother this morning. Now people would automatically just respond with comments such as, oh, how lovely. Just continue with your great work. Because no one was listening to what he was saying. Until finally one foreign diplomat came up. And he leaned in quietly and he said, I'm sure she had it coming. <laughs> We've got to listen for the voice of God. He's speaking to us, but we don't always hear him. There's many of us here today who need to go back to Bethel. We need to go back to that place where God first spoke to our hearts. We need to let God know once more that He can count on us. And God told Jacob to go back and dwell there, to go back to Bethel and stay there. Bethel represented that place where we can go to talk to God and He talks to us. He's longing for our return today for our close attention, for that special relationship where you and he walk hand in hand. We need that communication with God again. Jed Harris was a producer of the play Our Town and many other plays. And he started getting convinced that he was losing his hearing, so he went to a specialist one time. And he gave him a thorough checkup. And finally the doctor pulled out his gold pocket watch. He said, can you hear it ticking? He said, of course. So the specialist got up and walked across the room. Can you hear it? Yeah, I can still hear it. So then he stepped out the hall. And the farther he got away, he said, can you still hear the watch? And he had to think, yeah, yeah, I can still hear it. 
So the doctor comes back into the room and he says, Mr. Harris, there's nothing wrong with your hearing. You just don't listen. <laughs> and I think sometimes that's our, our problem. We just don't listen. We have to be still so that we can hear God's voice speaking to us. It's time to listen to what God is saying. Make the necessary steps to get back in tune with the Lord. We need to go back to that one more time. And now, if you stand.